This is Kane Sport inside the lines on the R Lads Football Network. Bowl season for the Miami Hurricanes. As uh, Gary, I got to tell you, the Miami Hurricanes can't wish this bowl season to start any faster after the way the season ended. And also maybe some retribution ahead after what happened when they were shut out last season in the bowl. So uh, this is going to be a big bowl game for the Miami Hurricanes. Oh, no doubt about it, Greg. Uh, You know, when you look at the way that they finished the regular season with that just absolutely disgusting loss to North Carolina, um, I think that what you're seeing is a football team that didn't want to go out that way. You know, they really, they took such a big step this season. People aren't looking at it that way because of the way the Carolina game looked. But this was a different football program in 2020. and, And, you know, they didn't look like a different football program against North Carolina uh, for a lot of different reasons, uh, you know, you, you never want to make excuses, and there aren't any excuses for playing that way. Um, but the program had gone through quite a bit of turmoil in the previous month with coaches in and out, players in and out, uh, and it may have just caught up to them a little bit that day. I don't think they beat a, a Carolina team that was playing at the level that they were playing at on any day. I think they would have lost that game regardless. Um, but I do think that everything that they went through the previous month contributed to the way that they looked against North Carolina. I think they do not want that to be the lasting memory of their season. And I think that is why Miami will show up in Orlando on Tuesday night. And hopefully they will be a little bit more invested in the game than we saw Miami invested in the bowl game a year ago that you very astutely <laughs> um, refer- referred yes, to. Yes, and we tried to forget after we talked about it early on in the season. And keep in mind, too, Miami is in a bowl drought. Uh, they are one and nine straight up in their last 10 bowl games, while Oklahoma State has won three out of their last four bowls and they've covered four straight bowls. As I welcome in our special guest, he's the gentleman on the left of the screen, Scott Wright from the Oklahoman.com. He covers, uh, of course, Oklahoma State football, and he's been with us uh, before here on the R Lads Football Network. Good to have you back again, Scott. Absolutely. Good to be here. Thanks for your patience, too. We had some technical difficulties before the show, and you were very patient. Thank you for that. No problem. All right, Scott. So uh, tell me, what's the mood for Oklahoma State after a huge, convincing end of the regular season win over Baylor, which was really big for them because they had stumbled a bit after starting the season 4 0, and they really needed that one? Yeah, they did. That was a a, a good, strong way to, uh, to finish up. Gave them some uh, some confidence after a, a TCU game the week before, where they really had every opportunity to win that game and and just let it slip through their fingers. The defense gets five takeaways against TCU, and uh, other than uh, a scoop and score, the offense does nothing with the other four turnovers that uh, that they were handed. So uh, that was a, a really frustrating loss. So to get the uh, that taste out of their mouth against Baylor and uh, and and really bounce back strong was important. Uh, now they uh, they go into a, a, a bowl game where uh, the defense is playing confidently. The offense has a little bit more rhythm and, uh, and, and they know they've got a tough, a tough matchup on their hands. And, uh, and uh, you know, from, from their perspective, they're hoping that they're ready for it. All right. Well, uh, you, Gary and I will uh, rotate some questions here for you, Scott. Uh, I'll start off. Uh, you, Talk about offense, defense. That's kind of what I want to get this thing kicked off uh, as far as questions with you because there's a lot of – I mean, when I take a look at it, Jim Knowles, this is his third season as the defensive coordinator. His first year, they were ranked 112th in defense, then 82nd, all the way up to 39th this year. So this is definitely uh, the strength of the team this season, and uh, this is the bright spot of the season, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Has been, you know, and, and that's been a little bit of the frustration, uh, which I'm sure you're going to get to with the offensive side of the ball. But the offense has uh, has really underperformed. But at the same time, the defense has uh, has excelled. And and outside of the uh, the Oklahoma game where they uh, where the the defense really had some struggles, uh, the defense has been uh, has been the uh, the bright spot for this team this year. And you even look at the uh, the Texas loss. The uh, the defense did not give up a bunch of uh, a bunch of long drives. They were they were put with their backs against the wall several times, and uh, and and Texas was able to create enough points off of it to get, get that game to overtime. So, uh, and then and then obviously winning it in overtime. So, um, the defense has been really strong all year, 
And, uh, and that's going to be, I think, the most fun part of this match. Uh, when you look at, uh, at what Miami does well on offense, uh, I think that's going to be a, a really fun ma- matchup on, uh, on Tuesday night. Yeah, let's talk about specific players then. Uh, 26th ranked linebacker, uh, I believe outside linebacker for Oklahoma State. I'll let you tell us how do you pronounce his last name, but uh, Amen is his first name. He's a senior with 177 tackles over his last two years, seven and a half sacks, 20 and a half tackles for loss, and four forced fumbles. Meanwhile, uh, Calvin Bundridge leads the team with six and a half sacks. Uh, Malcolm Rodriguez is the senior DB. Uh, he's had 259 combined tackles over the last three seasons. Uh, so uh, those are three interesting guys. And also uh, Colby Harvell Peel, who is the number six ranked safety for our lads heading into the NFL draft. He had an ACL injury last year, rehabbed it coming into this season. Uh, and uh, finally, Rodarius Williams, the 34th ranked cornerback, for our lads coming into the draft is brother greedy Williams. Tell me about some of these players and specifically, you know, who, who are the real guys that we need to keep an eye on besides them? Unless those are the top guys. Uh, well, yeah, you guys, but, uh, but I'll touch on some of those. Rodarius Williams has, uh, has actually opted out and won't be, uh, won't be playing in the game. He's going to get ready for the NFL draft, try to follow his brother's footsteps there into, uh, into pro ball. So, um, that's a uh, that's a big loss for uh, for Oklahoma State because he had really been a a shutdown corner for them this year. A lot of teams were avoiding him, not throwing at him, uh, and he was really taking away a, a good chunk of the field in the passing game. So he's going to be uh, he's going to be really missed. Amon Ogbongbomiga, the uh, the linebacker. I can't believe you didn't want to say that name. Uh, I still don't want to know it. I still that's okay. You got it. Does he have a nickname? Uh, he doesn't, unfortunately. <laughs> he needs one badly, but uh, but uh, Eamon, is, as uh, as most people know him, is uh, is is a really reliable guy in the middle of the field. That uh, that is a uh, a really solid tackler. And same with Malcolm Rodriguez. You mentioned his tackle stats. He's a guy that. Uh, uh, when he gets his hands on you, you, you're going down most of the time. So uh, those two guys are going to be really, uh, really key uh, in uh, in in their uh, their tackling ability. Uh, Calvin Bundage uh, will have an, an even more important uh, role, I think, in this game. You mentioned his uh, his sack stats. Uh, he's going to be, I think, even more important in this game because uh, uh, you know he comes in as uh, as really a uh, uh, a specialty kind of guy in in the pass rush okay. but uh, but the uh, the most re- reliable pass rusher that they have is Trace Ford. He suffered a knee injury against Baylor in the last game and won't be available. Okay. He had he recently had surgery and so uh so Calvin Bundage is going to be on the field a little bit more in uh, in that role particularly in passing downs and uh, and will be really important. Um you know, then you mentioned Col- Colby Harvell Peel, also Trey Sterling at the at the two safety spots. With actually, they have three safeties, but those two guys at safety uh, are are both really important. Um, Colby Harvell Peel has a couple of interceptions this year. Uh, Trey Sterling is a guy that makes plays all over the field. He uh, he, he will come up and help in uh, in run support. He'll come up and blitz on occasion, and then he's a a really solid cover guy as well. So. Um, all guys that are uh, that are really important to this defense. Uh, uh, before I switch it over to Gary, I just wanted to verify again. Uh, Harvey Peel, he's the sixth ranked safety for our lads. Is he the top defender talent wise on the team? Um, it's it's close. He's uh, he's he's right up there. Um, you know, with Rodarius Williams being out, I would probably say that he is uh, he is maybe their uh, their most important guy on the back end for okay. sure. Uh, the linebackers are really important as well. And Amen though. is an inside linebacker, not outside as I said yeah. before. Bundridge uh, is, is more of an outside edge rusher, as you mentioned. Okay, Gary. Yes. Yeah. You know, um, Scott, when I take a look at this game, I think it's going to be without question one of the better bowl games of, of bowl season. I really do. When I look at OK State. State um, I see one thing that I, I just can't put my fingers around, and, and that's the inconsistency. Uh, I, I mean, you, you know, we talk about defense is the strength of the team, and then I look at a 41-point output by Oklahoma a, a, against the Cowboys, um, 
I look at Texas Tech scoring 44 against them. So I need you to explain to me that, you know, why is this team as inconsistent as maybe it's been this year? Uh, you know, on on the defensive side of the ball, they uh, they had been really good about not giving up big plays. They're fantastic at getting off the field on third down. They're still good on third down. They're uh, they're second nationally in third down uh, third down percentage defense. So uh, that's that's going to be really key for them. But uh, not getting hit with the big plays will be the uh, the the, uh, the key for them against Miami because that's uh, that's the issue that's cropped up for them over the last uh, you know month and a half uh, they uh, like you said they were uh, really good against Baylor but uh, but that was a different type of ball game so uh, that's going to be the uh, the issue that they've got to address for Tuesday yeah and the Miami offense as I'm sure you know is all about big plays and, and it has been that way the entire season and uh, the, the offense coordinator Rhett Lashley who came over from SMU has done a phenomenal job setting up those big plays and and you know he'll try to lull you to sleep a, you know, a couple runs up the middle runs up the middle then boom now all of a sudden he's isolating a receiver one-on-one -on -one in the middle of the field and Miami's been able to win a lot of those matchups during the course of the season even though play after play after play maybe its offense wasn't performing as efficiently as they might like. So I agree with you. I think that is going to be a massive, massive aspect of this game. Now, another one that I personally believe is going to be significant is going to be Oklahoma State's offense, even though you're telling us that's not the strength of their team, against Miami's defense, which is going to be significantly weakened by the absence of defensive ends Jalen Phillips and Quincy Roche. And to me, those two guys um, took uh, what maybe would have been a pretty darn average defense this year and turned it into a de you know pretty good defense with the quality of, of their play game after game after game. So Oklahoma State's offense at times has been able to put points up in, in bunches. Um, they average almost 30 points a game and, and 427 yards. So they've been a decent offensive team at times. Where do you think Oklahoma State can most test Miami defensively in this game? You know, I think the uh, the those absences on the defensive line that you mentioned, I th I think those are uh, are going to open up uh, Oklahoma State at least hopes that they open up the run game a little bit because so much of what uh, of what Oklahoma State does on offense keys off of of, of running the ball well. Obviously, they're going to be without Chuba Hubbard, who has uh, who's moved on to the NFL draft, uh, but uh, but he had been injured a good portion of this. Season and really was only himself for about five games anyway. Uh, really an ineffective season for him, uh, and, a, and a frustrating one at that. So, uh, so they've been they've been playing with other running backs the last uh, the last month and a half anyway. So that's not really an issue. The the question is whether they can block because they've had a lot of injuries. And then you mentioned Tevin Jenkins uh, opting out, uh, but. Uh, but the offensive lines got to come together and uh, and be solid, open up the run game, and uh, and you know obviously with the uh, the guys out for Miami that you mentioned, uh, you know protecting the passer will be a little bit easier than uh, than it would have been uh, for Oklahoma State, and that was another issue that they've had at times with their their offensive line. Mike Cundy refers to it as musical chairs because uh, they have one guy go down and and it seems like uh, two guys have to move around to uh, to 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 fill a spot and uh so it's been uh, it's been a, a tough season for the offensive line but um look at what they're able to do offensively once they get the run if they can get the run game going uh that usually helps open things up for tylen wallace on the outside at receiver who is really their most impactful player uh on the offensive side of the ball and uh and then uh, and then the other receivers follow after that so um but Spencer Sanders is uh, is the key to uh, to all of this. They, they've got to have him playing consistently. Uh, he's uh, he's had issues with turnovers at times uh, during the year. You go back and look at the uh, the Texas game. That was one where he uh, he fumbled twice and threw an interception. Uh, both or all three that set up uh, Texas scores. So um, th that's uh, that's a real key for them is to have him playing. Uh, consistently. He doesn't have to uh, go out and be a world beater. He doesn't have to go out and throw for 400 yards. He just needs to be consistent, take care of the ball, and uh, and get the ball to uh, to his playmakers when uh, they've got opportunities. All right, Scott, uh, let's stay on offense because 
uh, Casey Dunn took over as the coordinator, uh, which I was actually pretty pleased about since I'm a Rutgers guy. Uh, Sean Gleason has done a fantastic job already uh, for Rutgers, uh, but there is there is a difference. I mean, you, you, three straight top twenties on offense, uh, and then you take a look at them drop a little bit in 2019, the 35th, but 58th this year. Uh, so, and and that's even like you you've talked about Chuba Hubbard. He's had some injuries, and Sanders has been inconsistent, but. You know, Dunn is a first-year coordinator. I know he's been with the team a while as a wide receiver uh, coach. Uh, how do the fans, how, what is their reaction to the injuries? Are, are they looking at it as, oh, those are pretty good excuses? Or are they a little bit concerned with Dunn as the coordinator? The, the fans are kind of split on Casey Dunn. I think, think he's done a really good job with uh, with the, the hand he's been dealt, uh, with everything that they've had to deal with. Um, you know, the, uh, the offensive line again has, has really, uh, limited what he's been able to, to do because of what they can protect and what they can block. So, um, that's going to be a, a, a real important key. They've, uh, they've had the, the same starting lineup for the final three games of the season. So, uh, they're, they need to, uh, to try to keep with that consistency and, and try to move forward because they've, uh, they've been been blocking pretty well. They've had a hundred yard rusher each of the last three games, and uh, and Spencer Sanders threw for over three hundred in the uh, in the Baylor game uh, to uh, to get the offense going as well. So um, if that offensive line can maintain some consistency, it really helps out Casey Dunn and what he can call. Is Sanders the clear number one going into camp next year, or are there? Any other young quarterbacks that will be nipping at his heels? Uh, is there a potential transfer? What's the situation there with Sanders in the quarterback position? I don't expect to see any transfers in, but uh, but I do think that he's going to have a quarterback competition on his hands. Uh, Shane Illingworth, a, a true freshman who came in and played when Sanders was hurt this year and uh, was reliable at times, uh, a little bit inconsistent in the Oklahoma game when he had to come in, but uh, – but against Oklahoma's pass rush, that was uh, that was a uh, that was a tough day. So um, it's uh, it's been uh, it's been an interesting season. But I think that uh, I think that there will be probably a, a quarterback competition going into the uh, the off season and, and into spring ball. You know, Scott, I had the pleasure of making it to Oklahoma once. It, 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 and I was I can't tell you how much I was looking forward to it, to be honest with you, because, you know, you grow up and, you you know, you're watching Oklahoma football and and you see what a great venue, you know, what what a great venue they have over there in, in Norman. And uh, so Miami played Oklahoma a few years back and I had the, the, the chance to go. But I also had the opportunity. I, I mean, and I was struck by how close the two campuses are relatively together. I think it was about an hour and a half drive. Yeah. that I made to go from Oklahoma to Oklahoma State. And I did a day-night doubleheader. Um, and I went and I, and I actually, Oklahoma, um, Oklahoma State that night was playing Florida Atlantic. And Florida Atlantic at that time was coached by um, a very dear friend of mine, Howard Schnellenberger, who, as you know, led Miami to the national title um, in 1983, 84. So um, I did that day-night doubleheader and I got to see the differences between the two programs and 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 they're they're very very different you know oklahoma is the football powerhouse the team that everybody expects to play for the national title every year without question and i i felt that oklahoma state was a little bit different oklahoma state was more your traditional college football team that you know, comes into every every season hoping to be you know a decent team. You got Boone Pickens over there throwing his fortune behind the program, but you know they're not really able to keep up with Oklahoma year after year after year. So since we have you on the show, and I I haven't been able to really reconcile this all these years, is you know what why is that, and where is Oklahoma State's place? Uh, in the state of Oklahoma and on the national stage in, in, in college football, what is the program hoping to accomplish? And it seems to me like they're okay playing second fiddle to <laughs> Oklahoma. Am I reading that? Am I reading that right or wrong? Uh, I would, uh, I would say that, uh, that, that most fans to, uh, they want to be where Oklahoma is. They want to, they want to be that type of program. 
and uh, and you know there are a lot of frustrations because you know Mike Gundy is two and fourteen against Oklahoma in his sixteen seasons, uh, even though he's had the the winningest Oklahoma State program in history. He won more games than any coach here. He's done it more consistently than any coach ever before him. Uh, even though he's done all of that. Uh, the fact the fact that he is two and fourteen against Oklahoma really uh, really eats at a lot of fans. And uh, the in, fact that he's still there supports my question. Exactly, you're you're absolutely right. Um, now, uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the one of the frustrating things for uh, for some people, even in leadership at Oklahoma State, is that uh, that his uh, his contract buyout is uh, is incredibly large, <laughs> and uh, and that's a little bit of a, of an issue. So. Um, but, uh, but you're right. It's, uh, it's, it's very odd to see a, a, a coach go, go two and 14 against, uh, against his rival, uh, and, uh, and still have success and, uh, uh, in, in all the other ways that they have. So it's, uh, it's a really tough situation that Oklahoma state is in right now in terms of, uh, of where they're going in the future, uh, with this, uh, with this program and, uh, whether they're going to be, uh, stuck where they are, or if there's something they can do to uh, to to change it and become a more consistent competitor at the top of the Big Twelve. What took place in the preseason uh, with Chuba Hubbard and with Gundy did that have any impact at all as far as the team was concerned this this season? Uh, and do you think that is going to have any lasting impacts as far as Gundy's concerned? You know, I don't. I don't think so. I think it. Uh, I think that he did the uh, the things that he needed to do in the off season before the season got started um, to uh, to to kind of heal some wounds there with, within the program. And uh, and he understood that uh, that there were things that he had been doing that uh, that that were uh, that were frustrating to the players. And and so he's changed his ways a little bit. Um, and that uh, that that incident did. Uh, did raise some issues with it within the program, within the uh, the athletic department, uh, but uh, but they still uh, he he still did what he needed to do to uh, calm the waters, so okay. to speak. Uh, before I let you go, uh, Tylon Wallace, you mentioned him before. He is the tenth ranked wide receiver at our lads as far as the draft is concerned. Fifth all-time uh, program history receiving yards over 3,300. Uh, compared to a lot of other Oklahoma State receivers, there's been some really good ones that have come out over the last 10, 15 years. How does he rank? Not statistically, but in your minds. I tell you what this guy does that uh, that, that stands out above, uh, above a lot of guys that I've seen at Oklahoma State is that he makes contested catches. He makes catches with guys all over him. He, uh, he he makes catches that, uh, that that you just you just don't expect people to be able to make, and uh, he plays a lot bigger than he is. He's only you know six foot six one, 195 pounds, uh, but he's very physical and uh, and a, a very good leaper. He's very good at, uh, at at catching the ball at its highest point. Um, you know he does some of those things really well. He's not. Going to go lay down a four three forty and uh, and just blaze past people. Uh, he's got good speed, but not great speed. And uh, and he's just a, a guy who uh, who runs routes well and gets to the right spots and uh, and makes catches uh, whether it's in traffic or wide. Uh, and is just a uh, he's got really reliable hands, and uh, that's the thing that that stands out to me about his game. And Dylan Stoner. Can he somehow find his way on a on a team in the NFL? I mean, there are guys like Scotty Miller from Bowling Green, and you know we see what's going on with the likes of Edelman with the Patriots. You know, can Stoner be one of those guys that could, you know, with good hands, good route running, that kind of thing, possession receiver? It, do you think he could make it in the NFL? I think he's got a shot. I, I think that uh, he's the type of guy that's uh, that's willing to do anything on uh, you know go play special teams and. And and do those things the, to be a, a a glue guy and uh, and and really help out and uh, and and give himself the best possible shot to uh, to make an NFL roster and and, uh, and yeah, uh, Scotty Miller is a uh, is a good comparison I think for him because that's the uh, that's the type of receiver that uh, that, that he is and, and can be I think at the next level if he gets gets in the right opportunity. 
Scott, appreciate it. Thank you very much, not only for taking your time to do the show, but uh, the extra work before the show, too. And uh, we look forward to getting an opportunity to talk to you again before the draft, where we can uh, pick your brain some more on some of these players. Uh, so, uh, again, thanks a lot. Uh, enjoy the game, and uh, we'll talk to you again sometime soon. Absolutely. Sounds good, guys. Thanks, Scott. Okay, so again, I uh, want to thank Scott Wright from the Oklahoman for joining us, uh, talking Oklahoma State football. And uh, this is just going to be a very interesting bowl game, Gary, because of the fact as we were talking with Scott, with the, you have the opt-out of uh, Chuba Hubbard, uh, which you can completely understand. He's got the injury situation. Why? I mean, there's just no reason. He's right now the number three ranked running back at our lads only behind uh, Travis Etienne and uh, the uh, and Harris uh, from uh, Alabama. So that's pretty good company. Uh, meanwhile, Miami, they've got some opt-outs, as you mentioned earlier on in the show, on the defensive side with Phillips and Roche. Who could blame these guys, just like Hubbard, for taking the time to take care of themselves? Yeah, they're absolutely making the right decision, Greg. I don't think anybody can dispute that. you got two guys that have had good seasons. They've solidified their draft stock. Uh, Jalen Phillips is you know, now projecting in the, in the middle part of the first round. Uh, Quincy Roche could go in the second. Uh, people see him as a potential outside linebacker in the NFL. So there's really you know, no reason for them to play in this game and take a chance on getting hurt and affecting their futures. Um, I also want to say that I just – Hope and don't think it will that, that these opt-outs diminish this game on Tuesday night, which I think is going to be a very good one. And in the bigger picture, I think that the bowl system in general, despite player opt-outs at the end of the year for different reasons, still has a place. Um, you know, it, it's it, you know you get some compelling games like this one that you don't usually get to see. Miami might never, you know, when was Miami going to play OK State again? Sure. I think the last time they played was 1971 or something like <laughs> yeah. that. Um, so, you know, we're going to get to see a compelling game and it's going to give a couple younger players an opportunity to play and position themselves for next season. When you look at a Jafari Harvey, a Cam Williams, for example, a defensive end, maybe even a Chance Williams, who are going to get a chance to get into this game and show the coaches what they have. Um, going into next year. You know, maybe you, you play well in this game and the coaches stay away from the transfer portal at your position, and that can significantly affect your career. So um, I'm looking forward to it, Greg. I, I think it's going to be a, a good ball game Tuesday night, and uh, I think it could go either way. I really do. I, I, I think yep. Miami is going to be challenged on the defensive side, as we've talked about. Uh, you know, I think OK State does have some decent balance offensively, even though they're missing a couple key guys. Um, so I think it could go either way, and it's going to be a great game. And, and uh, just to update the rankings for our lads from some of these players you mentioned, right now Jordan is the fourth-ranked tight end. Uh, Phillips is the fifth-ranked defensive end. Uh, Roche is the seventh-ranked outside linebacker. That's where uh, our lads, that's how they view Roche right now. Borealis, mm -hmm. the number one-ranked kicker heading yeah. right now, uh, heading into the NFL draft. Uh, you mentioned King. He's 18th, and that's dropped uh, as far as the quarterback position. So just uh, you know, backing what you were saying. Uh, Jared Williams is the 16th-ranked offensive tackle. Well, we haven't talked much about him this season. He's okay, Greg. I think when they get into the nitty-gritty, you know, I mean, maybe he can get drafted late. I think there's a chance he might come back as well. Okay. You know, we'll see what, hap we'll see what happens there. And Zach McLeod, 24th at inside linebacker. Amari Carter, 27th at safety so because look if king does come back there's no question he's going to need reinforcements he's going to need some of these guys to come back uh and another season with some of these young receivers that have blossomed taking a big step forward this season maybe take another step forward especially if jordan can come back uh makes all the difference in the world because if king doesn't come back and have talent around him I, I, and to tell you the truth, I wonder whether he does come back if he looks around and sees that he's kind of all by himself. Well, we just had a little thing, Greg, called National Signing Day. And uh, <laughs> Miami Miami got a few pretty good-looking uh, fortifications there at the receiver position that I think will make them better 
Uh, you, you know, you can never rely on a true freshman to carry your team, obviously. But, you know, in Brashard Smith in particular and uh, Romello Brinson, uh, I think they've got a couple guys, um, even Jacoby George, who can come in and play right away and, and, and make this offense even more consistent and better. So uh, King will have weapons around them if he comes back. Miami will be fine regardless of what Brevin Jordan does at tight end. They will have Will Mallory back. Yep. Um, they got a really good looking freshman, uh, Arroyo, coming in. And they had a freshman this year, Dom Mamorelli, who hasn't had a chance to play very much, but has done some good things on the practice field. So uh, King will have weapons around him. The running backs will be back, uh, you know, if he chooses to come back. And right now, I, I would say that that would be his smartest decision. Um, yep. But we'll see what happens. I agree. We mentioned that even though Miami has lost nine out of their last 10 bowl games. Uh, they, they're 2-0 and oh, straight up and against the spread in their last two bowl games versus Big 12 teams uh, <laughs> by an average of 20 points. There's per- a silver lining. Yeah, even though, of course, it's been a while. Those are the glory days, uh, I'm sure. Uh, also, Miami 7-3 and three straight up and against the spread in their last 10 versus Big 12 teams, including 5-0 and oh, straight up and against the spread coming off an ATS loss. So there are some good things there for Oklahoma State. Uh, they clobbered Baylor in their last game. So both favorites off a spread win of 30 or more are just eight, 16 and one against the spread since 1999. And, uh, and then we talked about also Oklahoma state one and five against the spread in their last six games. Uh, the only one they covered was the last one against Baylor. So they had that at least Oklahoma state had an opportunity to get a, a big win like a monkey off their back because they hadn't been playing well for a while before this game. But as we said at the very open of the show, Miami, that's what they need to do. They need to not only get the monkey off the back of what happened in North Carolina, but after what happened to them in the bowl game last year. Yeah. So I, you know, look, we have two teams that have reasons to play and uh, you know, Scott told us that OK state is a team with a lot of heart. They never give up and, and yeah, they're they're going to be down a few guys. Miami's going to be down a few guys, but I think we have two teams that are going to show up in Orlando next week. Uh, very invested in the result, and it's going to be fun f- to watch. And uh, we'll see what happens. Gary, appreciate it. We're going to wrap up the season. And uh, to- and and by the way, I know we didn't spend much time talking about the blue chip quarterback recruit uh, that Miami also has. So we'll talk more about that. Gary, appreciate it as always. Uh, enjoy the bowl game, and we'll talk to you soon. Okay, Greg, and uh, thank you for being such a great host this whole season. And I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk Miami Hurricanes football with you again, Gary. It's been a while, so uh, we'll continue that in 2021, the next time we talk on the air. All right, Greg, thanks a lot. Take care. Have a great holiday. You too. Merry Christmas.